The Beginnings series is what we've called this whole series of why we're studying through the book of Genesis. The first lesson that we had in the beginning series was chapter 1, verse 1 through 8 of the book of Genesis. You know it very well. In Hebrew, it was Bereshit bara Elohim et HaShamayim the et HaAretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But then the next week, which was the last week, we studied about the creation of man, didn't we? We studied about the creation of man, and today we're going to finish up on the creation of man and some other things. But last week, remember that the Bible says that God created man in what? In his own image. He created man in his own image. Remember we said that man was created in the image of God. That's what Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 says. Well, the Bible says that God is spirit. So if we're created in the image of God, what does that mean? It means that man was created with an everlasting spirit. He has eternal spirit just like God has. There's only one reason why God would create man in his image. And that's because he wanted us to be his children. We're the only creatures in all of creation that are created in the image of God. The monkeys are not. The snakes are not. The bears are not. The birds that fly in the sky, they're not created in the image of God. Only mankind is created in the image of God. And he said male and female, he created them in his image. So that means that you and I were first created in the image of God as spirit. But today we're going to be in chapter 2 of the book of Genesis. So if you need a Bible, just raise your hand and Barry will give you a Bible. But we're going to be studying the first 17 verses in chapter 2 of the book of Genesis. And in that chapter, in those verses, verse 7 is going to tell us that God forms man from the dust of the ground. Well, you say, well, I don't understand already then. If he created us as spirit, then how does he form us from the dust of the ground? And the answer is really simple. You and I are both spirit and physical bodies. We're created, first of all, in the image of God. We're spirit. But we also have a physical body. But thank God we're also spirit because bodies are kind of like old cars. One day they just break down. Now I've been talking to a lot of you this morning who are just as old as I am and, and we've been comparing what I call our war stories. Our war stories about how our bodies just seem to have all of these problems nowadays, don't they? They seem to have all of these problems and we just, inside we feel young, but outside our body just seems to be getting old and having these problems. We're not as young as we used to be. And if you're here today and you're young, I'd like to tell you it gets better. But after a while, things just start going downhill. But thank God we are more than just physical body. We're also created in the image of God in His image is spirit. He is spirit. So today now let's look at chapter 2 and beginning at verse 1 and I'll go through a few verses and then we'll stop and talk about what those verses mean. Now some of these verses are going to be really really familiar to you if you're Israeli, if you're Yehudim. If you're Jewish some of these verses you're going to know really well. But some of the verses you may think you know really well, but maybe you haven't looked at them in detail. And that's what we're going to discover today is what is the real story inside those verses. Verse 1, chapter 2 of the book of Genesis. Thus the heavens and the earth and all of the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done 
and he rested on the seventh day from all of the work that he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it because in it he rested from all of the work which God had created and made. Now, those verses are probably very familiar to you if you're Jewish. What are they talking about? They're talking about the seventh day. In Hebrew we know that is Shabbat, right? Nuchon, Shabbat. It says, Hayom HaShavii. Okay, the seventh day, but today we call that Shabbat. Why do we call that Shabbat? Because it said that God rested, He ceased, and that word in the Hebrew is translated, it's actually from Shabbat. It's a day of rest. It's a time of rest. But did you know it means something a little more than just rest? Now maybe you're a Hebrew speaker, but if you look at the Shorish, the root, if you look at the meaning of that word and what it really came from, you'll find out that it actually means to cease what he was doing. To stop what he was doing. It means that he ceased. He stopped what he was doing. And that's why he rested. You see, a lot of people today think that God rested because, well, after six days, he had created the heavens and the earth. He had created all the plants, all the animals, the sun and the moon and the stars and everything that is. And people say like, he must have really been tired. But no, think about it. The Bible says that God is all powerful, right? If he's all powerful, then I have a question for you. How does God get tired? He can't get tired. He's not like you and I. Now you and I can get tired. And some of us will get tired a long time before the others, right? But God is all-powerful. He can do all things and it never even makes Him concerned. He never even has to take a deep breath or anything. He doesn't get tired. He is not like you or I. In fact, some people even say, well, why did it take Him six days to create the heaven and earth? He really could have done it all in one second if you think about it. He could have spoke everything into existence at one time. But he chose to do this because I believe that in these six days, as we've discovered the last couple of weeks, there are stories there that we need to know about God. There are things there that he wants us to know about him. There's things there that he wants us to know about why he did things the way he did them. Why he did things when he did them. He wants us to know all of these details and that's why he didn't just do it all at once and say, I did it all at once, now let's get on with the rest of the Word of God, the rest of the Bible. There's information in these first few verses in these first few chapters that are very important to our faith. For instance, that very first verse, we quoted it in Hebrew earlier, right? Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, right there, if you think about it, God's not telling you how He did it. He's not saying why He did it. He's not saying if He used quantum electrodynamics physics or if He used Newtonian physics or if He used relativistic physics. He's not telling you anything about uh, you know, the, uh, the plasma that existed in the early universe. He's not giving you any scientific evidence. He's simply saying in the beginning He did it. And I believe the reason that he only said that is because he's setting the rules for the whole Bible. And the rule is, is that you and I must come to God in faith. We must come to Him believing that He is God. If you have to wait until you can see all of the details and all of the answers before you give your life to the Lord, then that's not faith. But the Bible says in the Old Testament, the Tanakh, and Gam Barbera Chadashah in the New Testament also, it says the just shall live. 
they shall walk by faith. The just shall live by faith. But the Bible says also that faith is the evidence of things that are not seen. Faith is the things that you can't see. So if you're waiting till you understand it all, if you're waiting till you see it all, then you're not living by faith. There's things that you're going to hear in the Word of God that are just going to sound right to you. You won't be able to understand them. You won't be able to explain the details or the science of them, but you will know that what is being said is just right. It just sounds right to your soul. And that is because your spirit was made in His image. And you are His child. That's one of the reasons why faith is so important. Is when He speaks, you understand that the message is from Him. When other people speak, and they're not talking about the Word of God, you have to evaluate it. You have to think, well, I don't know if that's right or not. There's something about that that just doesn't sound correct. But when God's Word is spoken, there's something deep inside that just hits the target. There's something that makes you understand. You better listen because this is unique. This is important, and the Word of God just has that effect in your heart. So we understand now from these first few verses of chapter 2 that on the seventh day, God rested. And in Israel, of course, this is a big thing. Now those of you who know me, you know that I'm Jewish. I was born into a Jewish family. You might say, well, you don't look very Jewish. Well, you can take my blood, it's Jewish. You know. Names in my family were Ema, Yaakov, Yosef, Ada. All of these people. You know, we were Jewish family, but they didn't know anything about what that meant. I'm the first one from my family to come to Israel. I'm the first one to learn Hebrew. And as I've told you many times before, it was really hard for me learning a new language because I was born and raised in Texas. You could even say I didn't really know English because... Texas people just don't seem to speak real English, you know. But anyway, here I am. And I'm here with you, and I'm as Jewish as you are if you're Israeli. But we're studying the Jewish scriptures today. God never gets tired. That's what we said. He didn't have to rest. He didn't finish creating man and says, Oh, that was, that was so hard, I better sit down and catch my breath. Come on, be real. God is all-powerful. He doesn't get tired, you see. So why did he stop? Why does it say that after six days of doing all these things, God rested? And the reason it says that is because that word also means he ceased. In other words, he stopped what he was doing. Why did he stop what he was doing? Because he was tired? No. Because he was finished. He was finished. He had already done everything. He didn't have anything more to do. So he ceased doing the work that he... So he rested from the work that he was doing. He stopped from the work that he was doing because it was all done. There was nothing more to do. There is nothing more being created today. You can make a cake. You can make a pie. But when you do, you're just taking ingredients and things that already exist and you're putting them together in such a way and you put it in the oven, you take it out of the oven and you made a cake or you made a pie. But when God made things, He made things from nothing. You say, well, I can make stuff. I can make a wonderful meatloaf. Well, that's pretty impressive. Let's see you make that meatloaf from nothing. Okay? You don't have an oven. You don't have meat. You don't have any seasoning. You don't have any spices. You say, let there be meatloaf. It's not going to work. Right? <coughs> but God spoke everything into existence from nothing. And He did that all in six days. 
And everything that has happened since then has been using those things that were made then. There's a law in physics called the second law of thermodynamics. You can know it by its short name. It's just entropy. Entropy means that something will always go from one state, from a high state of organization, to a lower state of organization. You could interpret that into common everyday language by simply saying that things get worse. They don't get better. If things are in a room, it's kind of like a child's room. You ever notice how you clean the room up one day and the next day it's not clean anymore? The third day after that, it's really not clean anymore. And by the time you've gone through four or five days, you're ready to burn that room. You know? That's the way entropy is. Is things that are organized go unorganized if they're left alone. That's the law of the universe. It's the second law of thermodynamics in classical physics, what we call entropy. So even the things that God did in those first six days of creation are now winding down like a clock. You wind the clock up, you set it over here, and it's winding down. And over time, the universe has been spread apart. It's thinning out. Things are now getting older. You know what I mean? Getting older? Kind of like me. I'm too young to be so old. I tell people that inside I'm still young, but on the outside, I look in that mirror in the morning, and I go, where did that guy come from? Things have changed. It's entropy. It's the second law of thermodynamics. Things are winding down. That's why these bodies don't live forever. But again, thank God that you and I were created in the image of God and the Spirit can live forever with Him. We'll talk about that in a little bit. In the same way that God rested from His work when it was finished, if you want to, Think about the New Testament now. What was that that Yeshua, Jesus, Yeshua is Hebrew for Jesus, what was that that Yeshua said on the cross as he was dying? It is finished. That's pretty interesting. I look at that like I look at the book of Genesis. I get some water. I look at that like I look at the book of Genesis because God stopped His work when it was all done. Jesus, as He's hanging there on the cross, having accomplished what He came to do, He stopped His work. Why? Because it was all done. And if the work is all finished, then guess what? You and I can rest. Because the work that he done was to give us righteousness before God. And once his mission, once his work was accomplished and he finished it, then you and I could be righteous before God by believing on the one that God sent, the Mashiach, Yeshua. By believing in the one that he sent, you and I could be righteous and now we can rest because the work is all finished. You see what I'm saying? So in the same way, we can rest now. Well, now the Shabbat, though, was a special day. That's a day that was given to Israel. Now, you know that, don't you? It wasn't the same ordinances, the same laws were not given to the Gentiles. Shabbat was given to Israel. In Israel today, we call it the Queen of Israel, right? Shabbat. And it's a big, big thing in Israel. But I think that a lot of people even in Israel today maybe don't understand what God was saying when He talked about the Shabbat. Oh, they know how to observe it. But maybe they don't all know why they are observing it that way. Shabbat was given to Israel. And you say, well, wait, I thought the Christians use Sunday. And that's their day of the week that they worship on. Here's the way it is. Shabbat was given to Israel as an everlasting covenant, right? 
But the Gentiles did not have that particular aspect from the law given to them. Why did they use Sunday? Even some of the Jewish people in the early church, among the early believers, they used Sunday because that was the day that the Lord resurrected from the dead. After He died for our sins, after He took our sins on Himself and died on the cross for us, history shows through many, many, many accounts, both by government officials and hundreds of witnesses, that He was laid in the tomb. But then he rose again from the dead on the third day. And he appeared to hundreds of people after that. Many, many witnesses. Reliable witnesses. Government people. Regular people. All of these people. And they all wrote down these accounts. And they were amazed that he had risen from the dead. But why had he risen from the dead? Because death is a result of sin. The soul that sins... It shall die. That's what God said in the Tanakh in the Old Testament. It's what we call the Tanakh in Hebrew, of course. He had said, the soul that sins, it shall die. Well, see, when God became a man and became the Mashiach for us, He took our sins on Himself, but He kept the law at all times. So He never had any sin of His own. So therefore, it was impossible for death to hold him in the grave. Death had to release him from the grave. So three days later, he rose from the dead, you see. That's how that works. Even though he died for our sins and took our punishment on himself so that we could be made righteous and forgiven before God the Father, Death could not hold him himself because he had no sin of himself, so he was risen from the dead. So many of the Christians today in the world will worship on Sunday. Well, you know, here we are in Israel. We're in Tel Aviv right now. And you know that Friday and Saturday, that's the weekend. Yom Shishiv, Yom Shabbat, Sof HaShavua, Nachon. It's the weekend. Okay, and on Sunday, everybody's at work. Sunday is like Monday is to the rest of the world. It's the first day of the week for working, you see? So in Israel, we're worshiping on Shabbat. In the rest of the world, the believers are worshiping, most of them are worshiping on Yom Rishon, which is Sunday in English. Now, there's some people in America and around the world that still worship on Shabbat or the seventh day of the week. But I've got to tell you, it really is not the important thing here. The important thing is that you are worshiping God. If you're an Israeli, if you're Jewish, then God has made a covenant with you about the day Shabbat. That's fine. If you're not Jewish, then God has talked to you about a day during the week where you get together with other believers and you are worshiping God. The Apostle Paul said it like this. He said, one man thinks that this day is more important than all the other days. And he does that because he wants to serve God and worship God from his heart. But Paul said, another man may think that this other day over here is more important. But he does that so that he can serve God from his heart. He said the important thing is they are both worshiping God from their heart. They are observing one day or another day to serve the same God. You see? Now we're going to talk about some details of Shabbat in just a minute that maybe you didn't realize. See, the scripture states that it's important that we enter into his rest. The Torah said that. The book of Psalms says that. The Tanakh, the Old Testament, if you will, for the English speakers. It all says that it's very important to enter into God's rest. What's he talking about there? Well, we saw that God ceased his labors. He stopped from his work. Why? Because he was tired? No, because he had finished his work. 
So you and I, he is now saying, should enter into the rest of God. Well, what are you talking about? It's just one day a week, right? No, it's the rest that you can rest from all of your work, all of your labors. Well, what work, what labors are you talking about, Stephen? About your works and attempts to try to be righteous before the throne of God. God has made a way that you can rest from your works. And if you enter into His rest, like the commands given you in the Old Testament and in the New, then you don't have to worry anymore. God will care for you. Did you know that the entire Tanakh is filled with the promises that God will care for you and if you should just trust Him and rest in Him? Psalms 55 verse 22 says, Cast your cares on the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. He'll take care of you. In Numbers, he says about our forefathers that came out of the land of Mitzrayim, the land of Egypt, he says of them, he says, I did not allow them to enter the promised land because they did not rely on me. They did not believe on me. It's the same word, lehamin, is to believe or rely or trust in. They did not rely on me. They did not rest in me. It's really important to God that you and I enter into His rest. It's really important to Him because it tells Him that you and I are not trying to establish our own righteousness. We don't try to do all of these wonderful things and then pat ourselves on the back saying, wow, you did a really good job there today. Oh, I did? Thank you. I didn't know anyone was noticing. You see, that's pride. And God hates pride. It says He will destroy the proud, but He raises up. He lifts up. He exalts the humble. If you humble yourself before God, He will lift you up. But if you are proud and you're talking about all the wonderful things that you've done and you think that you're righteous, then He will put you down. That's what the Bible says in the book of Proverbs in the Tanakh. But Scripture states that we must enter into His rest. Not our rest. You might rest if you think that you're righteous and you don't have any other good stuff to do because you've conquered all. You've learned how to do everything right. You never make any mistakes anymore. You never fail. You're always living your life perfect according to the law all the time. How many people are here that do that? No hands. There's no surprises. No one would say, I live my life perfect all the time. But there's some people that call each other righteous. Ah, tatsadik. You know, you're righteous, you're righteous, you're righteous. Wait a minute, let's be honest. The Bible says three times in the Tanakh, it says there is none that righteous. None that seek after God, they have all gone astray. Isaiah, Yeshaya, Hanavi, Isaiah the prophet says, And all of us like sheep have gone astray, and we've turned every one to our own ways. And it goes on to say in the very next verse, And the Lord has laid on him, the Mashiach, the iniquities, the sins of us all. You see, that's why this Messiah, this Mashiach, that's how you say it in Hebrew, that's why this Mashiach was such an important person in the Bible. is because He would come and take our sins away so that we did not have to die as a result of our sins. Now, I'm not talking about physical death. I'm talking about the real, the heavy-duty death, eternal separation from God. The body may give out after a few years, a few decades, 70, 80 years, who knows, maybe 100, maybe 50. But the body may give out after a while, but the spirit was designed to live forever. You can go through the physical death 
and everyone will. It's appointed unto man, the Bible says, once to die. But after that comes a judgment. That will be a judgment that will tell God whether you are to live forever or not. And if you have no sin in your life, you can live forever. The problem is we all have sin in our lives. Nobody denies that. We all understand that. But what can we do? Malasot. What can we do? We accept the sacrifice that He has provided in the Mashiach. And by believing in Him, we enter into the rest of God. And we are restored to God's presence. And we can be with Him forever in heaven like we were designed to be. The sin can't keep us from Him anymore because the sin has been paid for if we believe on the one that God sent to take our sins upon Himself. We trust in Him. We're entering into God's rest. Trusting in Him and we cease from our own works to try to be righteous. And you know what the interesting thing about that is? Is before we come to the Messiah, we try to do the right things, but we just never can do it. I mean, maybe we do something right every once in a while, but you look at our life and most of it is just a mess. We've done so much wrong. And remember, it's not just the things that you do on the outside. It's the thoughts that you have on the inside, too. God sees those thoughts. He knows all of your deeds. He sees that you've got all of this sin in your life. It's just so impossible. It's so hard for us to do righteousness all the time like that, isn't it? And you can't just do 51% and God has to let you in because He says, if the soul has sinned, it must die. That means even if you've done 1% sin in your life, you're going to be judged for your sin and the wages of sin is death. That's according to the Torah. It's according to the Tanakh. So how do you get around that? How do you get past all of that? And God says, there's only one way you can do it. Yeshua said it himself. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. Nobody comes to the Father but by my hand. That's what Yeshua said. The one that God has sent, believing on him, you've entered into the rest of God, and it no longer depends on you. But the interesting thing is, is after you enter into the rest of God, God sends His Holy Spirit to be in your life as He did in the prophets of old in the Tanakh. And funny thing is, is now you can do those things that you tried to do before and you couldn't do. Because it's no longer you that are trying to do them, but it's the Holy Spirit who lives inside you. And you're not doing them to earn your way into heaven anymore. Because that ticket has already been bought for you. That purchase has already been made for you by the blood of the Mashiach. And you're only doing these things now, these righteous works, to simply say thank you to God for the work that He has already done. That's the difference. And the funny thing is, is you do more righteous works that way than you ever did before you came to Him. And they're easier because it's not so important to you now that you're trying to earn your way into heaven. You're only doing them to say thank you to your Heavenly Father. It makes all the difference in the world what your mind is thinking when you're trying to do these things. And with the Holy Spirit inside you, He will do the things that you could never do. You see what I'm saying? That's why it's important. In fact, the Old Testament, the Tanakh, even has a verse that looks at us and it says, your righteousness is like filthy rags before God. Wow, that's a slap, isn't it? That's God telling us that even on our best days, even when we think we've done everything right and we're so good, God's just saying it's not enough. Because God's standard is perfection. He gave us the law and then He said, if you don't keep all of the law, then you're guilty of violating the whole law. 
It doesn't matter if you kept 99%. If you do one thing wrong, you're still a violator of the law. And according to his own word, he must judge you as a sinner because you have sin in your life. You see, sin is like a disease that consumes you. If it's in your life at all, it will gradually take over your life and it always results in death. That's what the Bible says, that the wages, the punishment for sin is death. That's why God said in Yehezkel HaNavi and Ezekiel the prophet, he says the soul that sins, it shall die. And so you see, that's the problem. That's the problem that we have is we all have sin. The Bible says, Ki kulam elohim. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody. Everybody. Oh yeah, one person is better than another person. And that person is better than this person. But this person over here is better than them all. But everybody has sinned. And everybody is on their way to eternal separation from God and that spiritual death unless those sins can be atoned for through the blood of the Mashiach. And you can only have that happen if you're believing on Him. Now we're supposed to be resting, right, on Shabbat. Supposed to be resting, right? I have a question for you. You know, in Israel today, there are so many rules about how to rest. There's 39 categories of rules that you have to follow to rest on Shabbat. A few years ago, we had an Orthodox Jewish lady that came to the congregation. She cried, and my wife held her. And she cried, she said, I don't know what to do. My rabbi now says that we can't even touch our nose or anything to scratch our nose, because if we do, he said that's work. Well, here's my question. If we're supposed to rest on Shabbat, but you have hundreds and thousands even of rules about what to do and what not to do on Shabbat, uh, that's kind of stressful, isn't it? Stress is the opposite of rest. How can you rest if you're so stressed worrying about whether you're resting properly? You see what I'm saying? If you have so many rules that you have to follow, then you're not resting. You're stressed. Let's be honest. And you say, well, how did we get to such a bad situation? And the answer is, is man started adding his own thoughts to the Word of God. God just wanted you to rest. Yeshua said it. He says, Shabbat was made for man, not man for Shabbat. God made you a rest so that you can enter into His rest and just cease from your worry, cease from your care, cease from your works to try to be righteous and rest in your heavenly Father that has made you righteous through His Mashiach, Yeshua. And then along come these hundreds of people and they write these thousands of rules says, no, well, if you're going to rest, you have to do this. Oh, you can't rest that way, you have to rest this way. And you're trying to remember all these rules and you're so stressed out that there's no way you can rest. Because stress is the opposite of rest. And rest is the opposite of stress. So you've forgotten the basic commandment because you're looking at all these sayings that man has added. There's a verse that we'll get to in a little bit that I want to talk about, and it's in Proverbs. I'll go ahead and quote it. And it says, Do not add to the words of the Lord, lest you be judged. That's in Proverbs in the Tanakh. And yet today in Israel, there are thousands of people daily trying to add their two cents worth. We're in Israel. Their two agarots worth to the Word of God. But God says, if you do that, I'm going to judge you because then you're making the people think that what you're saying is the Word of God and they've lost track of what my Word says and they're only paying attention to you. 
God says, if you add to my words, I will judge you. That's what the Tanakh says. You can look at that verse in Proverbs. We'll get to it in a little bit. There's some stories about Shabbat that I want to tell you, just real quick. You know what an Eruv is? Yehudim, Jewish people, you know what an Eruv is? Eruvim? An Eruv is a neighborhood in an ultra-Orthodox or an Orthodox area. And it, it turns out that they have made an entire community or several houses or streets together. They've turned that into one big dwelling. And here's why they did that. The law in the Torah says that you cannot carry something from your house to somewhere else. The rabbis translated that and said the law means that you cannot carry something from a private domain from someplace, your private residence, to someplace in the public on Shabbat. You can't carry something from your house to someplace in the public. So they got technical. And the rabbi said, that means that you cannot carry something from a private domain to a public domain. Then they said, well, what's a private domain then? And they go, well, the walls of your house. It's the walls of your apartment. Inside, you can carry whatever you want from one room to another on Shabbat. But you cannot carry something outside and go into the street because that's a public street, you see. And so they said, well, that's kind of hard because that means I can't go anywhere. I can't do anything on Shabbat. And then one clever gentleman made the observation that, well, let's see, what is a wall really? It's just a line that goes down my room, and then it goes this way, then it goes this way. If it's just a line, then maybe we can build a fence around our neighborhood. And maybe we can call that fence a wall. And then maybe we can treat all of that neighborhood and all those streets as just one private residence on Shabbat. We'll transfer the ownership to somebody else on Shabbat. And after Shabbat's over, he could give us back our houses. And they did that as a loophole. Now, I don't know what the word in Hebrew is for loophole. But they did it as a way to get around the Word of God. You see? So then another clever gentleman said, Well, hmm, what are those lines up there on those poles? Someone said, oh, those are telephone lines. Those are electrical lines. And he goes, hmm. They go all around our community, don't they? They go over here to this street, over here to this street, and all these stores and everything. He said, what if we call those telephone lines walls? Then someone said, that's a wonderful idea. Then we can walk from our house. We can walk out to the street. We can walk out to the stores. We can do all of this stuff. And it's all our house on Shabbat. And so they called the technical term for that. The Hebrew word is Eruv. And Eruvim is the plural of Eruv. But here's the thing. They eventually said, well, yeah, we got the walls. Because here's the electrical lines going up on the poles all around our community. But really, honestly, God's not going to look at that as our place unless it has a door. And they said, well, then we'll make a door. And in Jerusalem today, you can go into the Erevim and you can see the lines that go around the community and there will be on one of the poles hanging from it something that looks like a door. I'm serious. Something that looks like, excuse me, something that looks like a door will be hanging from these lines or one of these poles. I got a question to ask. You know, look, God's up there. He created the heavens, the earth. He formed the universe, hundreds of billions of stars and hundreds of billions of galaxies. He holds all things together by the word of his might, quantum physics, uh, relativistic physics. He understands it all. He created it all. And you think he's going to be fooled by seeing your lines as walls 
and some thing hanging there as a door? You think that's going to fool God? Get real. Think about this. What do you think God is? Do you think He's wise? He's wiser than you could ever imagine. He's infinitely wise. He's going to see through your plan. But the problem is, is in the heart of man. The problem is, is that man did not want to keep the law of God, and so he looked for a way around the Word of God. That's the number one problem right there. That's the number one problem. There's ladies that cannot leave their apartments in the Eruv, in that neighborhood. They cannot leave their apartment and lock their door because as soon as they leave their private dwelling and they put that key in their hand and they walk down the street, the rabbis have told them that you're doing work by carrying that key. I'm serious. I'm telling you the truth. These are the rules in Israel today in the Erovim. So they found a loophole. They found a way around it. They said, well, the rabbis say I can wear jewelry on Shabbat when I'm traveling on public roads. So I'll wear a bracelet and it can have all of these little things hanging from the bracelet like bracelets normally do. But I'll make an extra place on that bracelet and I'll hang my key on the bracelet. Now it's not a key anymore. It's part of my jewelry. So they found a loophole. And that's how they carry their keys today in the Orthodox communities in the Erovim in Israel today. That's how it works, you see. But the problem is, is the heart is wrong because they're always looking for a way around the Word of God. If the heart was right, they would say, God, you're right, I want to do what you want me to do. I don't understand it, but I want to do what you want me to do instead of always trying to find a way around it. Let me ask you a question. Isn't that kind of like you're in school and the teacher is going to give you a test and he says, now I want you to sit down at your desk and you take this test, but this is not a test where you can have a book. You cannot have your book open while you're doing your test. So what do we do as children? We say, oh, and then I'll write a little piece of paper with the answers. I'll have what we call a cheat sheet. I'll write all the answers on a little piece of paper. And the teacher says, you're cheating. You go, no, you said a book. This is not a book. This is a piece of paper. You're cheating. The bottom line is that the men representing the Word of God have become cheaters. That's a harsh thing to say. But that's what happens when you start adding man's interpretations and man's rules to the Word of God. Forget about all that. Go back to the start. Go back to the source. Go back to the Word of God. Study what we call hapishat. The pishat is the simple interpretation of the Word of God. You don't need somebody else to tell you what somebody else told them about the Word of God. You can go to the Word of God. You can understand it. You're understanding it today as we're going through these verses. Go back to where you first began. Go back to the Word of God. Yeshua had said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. The other people are simply saying, Come unto me, and I will load all sorts of other things on you to do, and I will make sure you have thousands of other things that are not even in the Word of God, and I will tell you, you must keep these too. And people do that so that they can appear to be the experts. People do that so that they can appear to be important to other people. But God says, If you add to my word, I will judge you for it. I think about Israel today 
And there's many rabbis that I know and respect. Most of them don't do this. But there's a lot of rabbis that add to the Word of God. I don't respect them as man of God because God doesn't respect them as man of God because He says, when you add to my Word, I will judge you. He doesn't like it when they add to His Word. I heard the story about a lady. She's actually a comedian. She says that when she was a teenage girl, she was so rebellious. She used to go into the women's restroom and there would be this sign up on the, the stall where the toilets were. There would be this sign, and one of those picture signs, you know, and had the picture of all these things that says, don't throw these things in the toilet. And there was like five or six or seven things and pictures of things. Don't put this in the toilet. Don't put this in the toilet. She said she used to find new stuff to put in the toilet to see if they would change the list to add that. If they would change the sign to maybe add the things that she put in there. Some people are just rebellious against the rules of God, you know. You got to have the right heart. The problem is, is that we're looking for ways around the Word of God instead of returning to the Word of God. That right there says that our heart is not right. That right there says that you're not a godly person if your whole life is built around trying to find loopholes or ways around the Word of God. Now, He has released us from the law because He has taken our sins on Himself through the Mashiach Yeshua. And we can be righteous not because of things that we've done in the law, but because of the righteousness that He gives us because He forgave our sins and took our sins on Himself. But let's be honest. I want you to understand one thing. If you're adding to the Word of God and you're trying to get around the Word of God, you're not a man of God. You're just a cheater. Let's be honest. It's just the way it is. You might have convinced people that you're a man of God because you talk about God a lot. But you're just a cheater. And the Word of God is something that you've forgotten. And you've been away from the Word of God for so long that you think that you are now the Word of God. You need to return. You need to repent. You need to come back to the Lord. And He will forgive you and He will restore you. But you have to acknowledge that that's what has to be done. Proverbs 30 verse 5 through 6 says, Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. Now listen to this part. Verse 6 says, Do not add to His words or He will rebuke you and prove you to be a liar. One day in the judgment, before the throne of God, there's a lot of so-called godly men who are going to stand before the throne of God and they're going to be shown to everybody that they added to the Word of God. And God's going to rebuke them and show that they were just lying. That's according to this verse in the Tanakh. Now that's a very hard thing to hear. But you have to be honest if you're going to be healed. Okay? Verse 4 continues and says, This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord made the heavens and the earth, before any plant was in the field, in the earth, and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist used to come up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And verse 7 says, And then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. This part of the scripture simply tells us two things. First of all, it says that God had not caused the garden to grow yet because there was no rain, number one. Number two, there was no man to till the ground. No man to work the ground. Hmm. I thought 
when we're in heaven. I thought when we're with God, we're just going to be sitting around on white fluffy clouds all day playing harps and stuff. You mean God's got stuff for us to do? That's pretty cool. This is before sin entered into the world and God had a job for Adam. He was going to till the ground and keep all of the things in the garden and God had given mankind dominion over all of the plants and over all of the animals of the earth. Man was had a very, very important job, you see. The second thing that you need to notice about this is God formed the man from the ground. It says, Yitzer Elohim, et Adam Mehadama. Okay? He formed the man from the ground. He took dirt and he made it into a man. If you're an English speaker, you probably wondered why God chose Adam. He said, well, alphabetically, of course, A, B, C, you know. He, you know, he was the first man, so he started with the first letter of the alphabet. No, you're wrong. He was called Adam because he was taken from the Hebrew word Adama, which means ground. Adama means ground, so Adam came from Adama. That's why God says, I will call him Adam because he was taken from the Adama. You see, you Hebrew speakers, you know that already. So he was taken from the Adama, he was called Adam, and this was the second part of his life. He's already been created as spirit in Genesis 1.26. Now he's being formed into a physical body. He's two parts. You and I are two parts today. We have spirit that was designed to live forever, and we have a physical body that, let's be honest, no way is it going to live forever. I mean, you know, some of us are trying to get a couple of more years. Some of us are trying to get 10 more years, 20 more years. You know, if you're a young person, you're probably not even worried about it yet, but stick around, things might change. So God formed us from the ground and he made us into a physical body. Now we have a spiritual part and we have a physical part. A lot of people today forget that. A lot of people today think that they're just a physical part, just like another animal. And when this dies, well, that's all there is. Surprise, surprise, they're standing before the throne of God, and God's saying, what did you do with your life? Did you receive my Mashiach? And I go, oh, Spirit, uh, wait, wait, wait. I was just a body back there, and that body died. What's all this spirit stuff? You need to remember what the Word of God says. You were created to be a living spirit, and then you were formed to have a physical body as well. Spirit is designed to live forever. Body, no way it's going to live forever, you see. And so we need to remember this. Now verse 8, we're going to conclude now. Verse 8 says, Then God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there He put the man whom He had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. See right there that tells you there must have been a chocolate tree. Because chocolate's really good for food. I'm just kidding. But it says, And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that was pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Two trees. Shneetzim. Two trees. One is the tree of life. The other is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We'll get into that in just a moment here. It says, Now a river went out from Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon, it is the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Bdilium and the onyx stone are there. Verse 13 says, And the name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. Verse 14 says, The name of the third river is Hidekel. It is the one that goes toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now, 
everything in the Word of God means something. I think it's important for us to notice as we close out on these verses today that even the naming of these rivers means something. Did you know that in Ezekiel 47, in the Tanakh, Yehezkel Hanavi, Ezekiel the prophet, chapter 47, Ezekiel is given a vision of the new temple of God as it will be. And underneath that temple there is a river flowing out that then turns into these different places and goes out and waters the land. And God tells Ezekiel, everywhere this river goes, there will be life. It will take with it life and the tree of life is going to be there, we see from the book of Revelation in the New Jerusalem that God is going to bring down from heaven and God's presence will be with man on earth and the river will be there flowing out from the temple and going to all of these areas carrying with it the tree of life and its influence on those waters. And everlasting life will be available everywhere it flows, you see. And so even then, in the Garden of Eden, with these four rivers going out into the land, they were carrying with them blessings because God was there in that garden walking with man. And those blessings of life would be carried out into all the surrounding country, into all the surrounding area and everything. And that life would be carried. That was the plan that God had before sin came and destroyed all of that. And that's the plan that God is going to do again once sin has been taken out of the world and now it's been taken out through His Mashiach once He executes a judgment on sin and He sets up His kingdom in righteousness. Then this is the way it will be again because God will not be defeated. What He designed at first was perfect. And once sin is taken away and He's ruling and reigning in righteousness, this is the way it's going to be again and it's going to work just fine. The tree of life was in the middle of the garden. The rivers would take this life and distribute it. Then in verse 15 as we close, Then the Lord took the man and He put him in the garden of Eden to what? To tend and to keep the garden. To tend and to keep it. There was a responsibility that man had even in heaven with God at that time. Verse 16 says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge, now check this out, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. You see, here's what the deal is. God gave man choice. He made man in His image. Well, God is all-knowing. God is wise. God can do this or He can do this. He has choice about what He wants to do. He made you, He made me in His image. He gave us the ability to choose one thing or another. There's people in the world today that have a theology called Calvinism. Calvinism simply says that man doesn't have a choice. That God either created him to go to heaven or he created some people to go to hell. And the reason why they say that is they say that God is sovereign. He doesn't need any help from man at all. Therefore, he tells man what to do. Therefore, he created some men to be saved, but other men he must have created to go to hell because we know that many people will go to hell. Some will go to heaven. Some will go to hell. Therefore, God must have created some to go to heaven, some to go to hell. That's what Calvinism says. The problem is, this is a big, big thing. The problem is, is the reason why I do not believe in Calvinism is they say this because they're trying to protect the sovereignty of God. They're saying that God can do anything. Man doesn't need to do anything at all. God does it all. And I say to them, well, then you're the one taking away the sovereignty of God. Because you're telling God, God, you could do anything you want except for one thing. You can never create a man who truly has choice. You see what I'm saying? 
So they're making a rule that God, you can't create a man that truly has choice because we don't believe that would glorify you. And they're telling God, you can't do that, God. And yet they're saying that because they want you to believe that God can do everything. He can do everything, but He chose to give you and I choice. We can make a decision. And every time there's a choice, if He gave us a, the ability to choose, then in the garden, it wouldn't matter if He gave us that ability to make a choice if He did not make a way to test that choice. So He put a garden in, the, He put a tree in that garden called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then he told them not to touch it. You ever done that with a child? So now I'm going to put this here. Don't you touch it. What's the first thing that child does? He goes and touches it. He's looking at you the whole time. You turn your back and he goes like... Because you told him not to. Right? But how do you discover the heart of a person? If he has the ability to choose good or bad and he's presented with the opportunity to choose good or bad, then you know what his heart is really like. If he chooses the good or if he chooses the bad. So God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden and he told man not to touch it. But he was testing man. He knew that man God knows everything, right? He knew that man would touch it. He knew it. And I think that that was for a reason. Because God knew from the beginning of time that man would take that fruit from the forbidden tree and he would eat that. God knew that. He knows all things. All the way to the end of time. And he's known everything from the beginning of time, right? So why would he put the tree there? And I believe he put it there so that man would understand, so that man would come to know that he's really a very sinful creature. That he doesn't have the willpower to do good. He doesn't have the self-control to do good. In other words, so that man would know that he needs God's forgiveness. So that man would know that he needs God's grace. That he does not have the self-control and the willpower to do good at all times like he should. So this was a way of bringing man to the knowledge that he needs God's forgiveness. And I believe that in the same way you and I have a choice today. We can enter into the rest of God by receiving His forgiveness through His Mashiach, Yeshua. Or we could walk away from it and keep trying to do on our own all of these things that are good and will fail tragically so many times. And we'll never quite get it right and certainly we won't be perfect, but that's the standard that God requires. We can enter into His rest or we can keep trying ourselves and have a tragic end. He calls us to rest. He gives us a choice. A choice is ours. He's not going to force us one way or the other. He's given us the power to choose. Choice is ours. Amen?